My guest today is a leader, expert, and trusted advisor in data science, AI, and mathematics with a wide range of experiences in business, industry, government, and research internationally. He is the author of five books and many scientific papers and has been an invited professor at numerous universities worldwide, including Yale and Georgia Tech here in the U.S. He is the mastermind at Last Ditch Consulting. My guest is Philippe Barbe. I'm Aidan Nepom, and this is The Changed Podcast. Change podcast. I'm really excited to have this conversation with you. Thank you, me too. I'm I'm particularly intrigued um, by your perspectives because you you are actually in the world of problem solving and understanding data and trends and and the science behind those things. So I feel like you're going to have some things to say that I might not have thought of already. Well, we'll see. Hopefully, it's the case. <laughs> I guess we'll find out. You know, if I don't bring anything, then it's not useful. <laughs> <laughs> well, honestly, everybody's perspective has been really useful in, in my book so far. I'm, I'm really intrigued by um, everyone's take on what it means to change or to be changed or to inspire change in other people, to be change makers. It's like this, you know, the word change, I, like many words, is very big. You know, I, I thought of it a little bit in in corporate setting because of this person I connected you to. Um, Eric Mukherjee, uh, but but actually yesterday I was more seriously preparing this podcast and I started to you know jot down a bunch of stuff about change, and I was actually really surprised by how much uh, the topic is inspiring. Actually, it's, it's a really inspiring topic. So it's, Thank it's, you. Uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, look, my work definitely centers around change. Specifically, the work that I do is around helping people collaborate and communicate more effectively so that they can create game-changing ideas with each other. And support those initiatives successfully, um, because if you can't communicate your ideas well, if you can't collaborate with others to think outside of your own brain, then you're missing out on a lot of opportunity. And your likelihood of success, of course, if you can't communicate your ideas to other people, is like. Yeah, you know, I think that's can't... the way. That's that's one of the things I like about your podcast that I know a lot of people. I mean, I, I've not a lot, but but I heard you know I, I read some of the stuff on uh, helping people and. Uh, coaching and the like and what what i and it's something maybe we touch about it uh on the last part which is all the thing about prescriptive and normalizing behavior that, that you mm -hmm. people set kind of expectation like you have to change for the sake of it and and right. what i like about what you do is that you it's more about telling story offering people and and that's something i, I really appreciate thank you yeah i mean i think it's a really good point that you bring up that we talk about um, people like in personal development, people talk about having to change something because they think they're supposed to. I actually had a conversation yesterday with a woman who was very concerned about her relationship dynamics. Now, this is outside of my area of expertise. I focus, it's not, but it is. I don't focus on romantic relationships. I focus on workplace relationships, but these things are certainly um related, but she was sharing something very personal with me, which was that it, whenever she would have a personal conflict with this person, her instinct was to run away and to just get away. And I thought to myself, that's interesting. That's a survival response. To run away is a survival response. So I'm not a person who's going to say, you should change that because I, I don't really know what the context is. And if you're having a survival response coming up in conflict, seems like you might want to examine the trigger for the survival response, not the survival response itself. Something I see as a, as a French person living in the U.S., and I've been living in the U.S. for 20 years, I'm now an American citizen, I have you know, children who are Americans, uh, is that I, I find people in the U.S. are seem very afraid of conflict. Yeah. They, 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 they really don't like conflictual discussions. Right. Uh, while the French like, we tend to argue for forever on, you know, politics, uh, sex, and religion, you know, the, the three taboo things, I would say. <laughs> yeah, well, they're fun. Uh, they're fun and exciting topics if you're willing to enjoy <laughs> having conflict. Yeah, and, and, and I think that, that, that uh, yeah, people tend to hide conflict. And I find, to spe specifically in the corporate world, it's really interesting in, in large corporations that you have this 
kind of very consensual meetings where nobody say much. And at the end of the meeting, you start to see groups forming and people are <laughs> just bashing at you know, the other group. <laughs> a lot of it is total comedy, a total fiction that somehow people need to maintain for I don't know what purpose. But... I mean, I, I must say as a consultant in some of these companies, one of the most remarkable things that I get to do is I get to say to people, you know, the things that you're telling each other outside of the meeting room, those belong in the conversation inside the meeting room where everyone can be involved. Yeah, so you, yeah. you attend the meeting, you leave the meeting, and then you talk to one person about something that you wish somebody would have said that somebody should have been you and it should have been in the meeting. <laughs> so let's do this. Here's something that I think would be really interesting for people to know about. And the reason that I wanted to talk to you in the first place is you've recently, I think it's recently, created this consulting uh, company called Last Ditch. Is that right? Is that new? Yeah, that's right. That's right. It's very, it's very recent. It's actually a few days old, so to speak. Uh, um, so, so um, you know, a mutual connection of ours was telling me about this. This is our first time meeting, but I, uh, I was super intrigued by this idea of if somebody else can solve your problem, go to them. Yeah. So the, the reason I created this company um, is because I met, so I did some consulting at some point before. And I also work for a large corporation more recently. And one thing that I've seen over and over is companies spending lots of money on consultants. And in particular, I remember one company that had done all the big consultancies. They had spent millions of dollars. And I remember them, them telling, yeah, well, it was kind of useful, but really they didn't really solve our problems. So, and it's a scenario that I've seen over and over. I mean, not that these companies you know, are bad, but they, they, it's not necessarily their, their expertise or maybe they, they don't spend enough time or maybe they send two junior people or maybe even the company that asked them to come over didn't really know what they wanted. Mm -hmm. But what I've seen, and, and, and don't think that most of the consulting uh, uh, agreements are, are not a success, Okay. But, but nevertheless, I've seen uh, many corporations that hire consultants that failed to deliver them uh, what they need. Mm -hmm. And th th there are several reasons for it, but sometimes it's also because the primes are uh, incredibly difficult and people just don't have the technical expertise. What I find is interesting for me, because I'm looking constantly for actually novelty and change that, that, mm -hmm. that you know, is the subject of what we're talking about, I, I like new problems. And I thought, well, it's kind of interesting to see that you have all these companies that don't get their problem addressed. And there is me who is looking for constantly new problems. And so you put the two together and you say, well, wh what about trying actually to address these needs, which mm -hmm. would guarantee me that I can select which one I take, which one I don't take. And so that's the idea of last ditch consulting. Now, you may say that it's very presumptuous of me to think that I can solve those problems. Uh, and I'm not denying that aspect. Uh, but at the same time, the way I structure the price, for instance, is that I take most of the risk in the sense that it's, it's a company that provides you consulting on a value, uh, the, 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 the price is how much you value it. So mm -hmm. if at the end of a month or two months or whatever the engagement is, you don't get what you need, it's like a product. You know, if you buy, a pant and you don't like it, you return it. So last ditch is the same idea that if we don't provide you value, then you shouldn't repay really for it. And that's the idea that, well, th then you, you are willing to take the risk with this company. Now, of course, it's also my interest if I take your project that I'm reasonably confident I can solve it because it's obviously not my interest that at the end you tell me, well, you didn't solve my problem, therefore I don't pay you. Okay, so what I like about it is that in this way, you completely align the goal of the company less the company and the goal of the consultant. Mm -hmm. we, we share exactly the same goal. My goal is not to take your money because if I don't deliver you anything, mm -hmm. then you're not going to pay me. So I'm completely aligning my goals with your goals. And, and that's another thing that I find is interesting. Now, it's a bit of an experiment, and you know, I don't know whether it will succeed or not. Uh, if I'm doing it, is that I hope it will succeed. 
Uh, but, but that's the idea of leverage. I just think it's fascinating because it's definitely a reversal. Um, a lot of consulting firms, the idea is I'm going to do my best to give you what I think will be helpful. And it's up to you to make it valuable to your company. But you're saying the opposite. If you're not getting value, don't, don't pay me. Oh, yeah, because you should be completely focused on the customer. You, you, know, you, you do yeah. something for the customer, not for you. Now, of course, I want right. to have fun in doing it, but the, the, what I'm trying to do is to serve customers. It's not customers who serve me by paying me. So it's talk the to way me it about be. this. Talk to me about this, um, this sort of Sherlock Holmes interest in solving problems and novelty, novelty specifically. That's, that's the, for me, when I hear the word novelty, I think that sounds like Sherlock Holmes. He doesn't want to be bored. He wants to solve interesting mysteries. Yeah, but that, I think it goes back to my past as a professional mathematician. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and maybe I should elaborate a little bit on, on what not only mathematicians, but people who do professionally research uh, do. And it's very different to do research uh, in a corporation where you have kind of a product you want to develop, but it is a, a very clear end point versus, I would say, doing research in an, a more academic setting where you kind of set your own endpoint and uh, you can change it anytime you want. You know, mm -hmm. your, your paycheck doesn't really depend so much on whether you solve or not that problem. So what, what, what I find is interesting. Um, so as a, a researcher, the first thing that people need to realize is that the job of a researcher, I almost want to say, is to fail every day. And, and, and the reason is very simple, that if I can solve a problem in five minutes, uh -huh. then I'm wasting my time. It's a problem which is too simple. So as a researcher, I'm not doing my job. Yeah, I mean, most of the time, okay? There are exceptions. Sometimes you have a great idea in five minutes. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> the, the reality is that most of the time it's, it's, it's really hard work. And if you can solve a problem in a day or two, that means that plenty of other people can solve it. And therefore, you haven't really done your work in terms of advancing knowledge. You know, you, you kind of take some existing knowledge, you repackage it in a few days, you are done. This is not really serious work. Uh, particularly as a mathematician, most people will tell you, but I mean, there's people super smart who can do a lot of things very fast. But, but, but most you know, high caliber mathematician, they will tell you they spend a lot of time working on something and there are times it takes you years actually to find a solution to your problem. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so in order to do this type of job, you have to like uh, the challenge of trying to figure out something. And, and I'm somebody who is very intellectually curious. Uh, and, and I find there is something really, um, it's not really appealing, but it's obsessive, I would say, about it that you, you start to have this problem in your mind and you just want to know the solution. You know, I want to know whether something is true or not. That, that's really what it is. Can you give an example of a problem that would, that would tickle this part of the brain, of, like something you've either solved or that you're trying to solve? So it, it, it's, it's a little hard to explain, but, but I, I, can, I can give you kind of rough idea. Okay, so, so okay. You, you imagine, for instance, uh, like, a, like a, a checkboard you know, a checkerboard. So you have, you have all the squares and, okay. and you look at between the, the, between the squares. So you, you can say, let's say, I, I start on the lower left corner. Okay. And I'm going to go to the upper left corner by following the edge of the squares. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I can only go right or up. I can never go backward. I can never go down. Okay. okay. So now you can ask, well, in how many ways can I go from the bottom left corner to the upper right corner. And you, 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 we'll, we'll see why we want to know that, okay? But, but, but you can ask this question, I know how many ways can I do it, okay? It turns out it's actually a fairly simple problem, which is very well understood. So you can ask something a little more complicated, which is, well, as you're going to move along that path, there will be a certain number of squares below that path. Uh -huh. Now you can say, well, in how many ways can I go from the bottom left corner to the upper right corner in such a way that I have 53 squares under the path? 
exactly 53 squares. How many ways can I do it? So of course, oh, it that's... depends on many things. But the question is, how do we compute that number? And, and it turns out that nobody really knows how to do these things very effectively, particularly when you have a very large lattice and you start to ask, well, let's, let's say you have something super, super large, like a huge checkboard. And you say, mm -hmm. I want 10,351 squares below my path. How, mm -hmm. how, how, how many paths do I have to do this? And so you can start to ask these questions. And, and it turns out there is a, a very large class of equations that somewhat describes the solution to these problems. But these are not very well understood. And so I wanted to understand these equations much better. And, and, and I was very obsessed by it because what happens when you do math is that you have an idea about the solution, which become a conjecture. So you say, okay. well, it, it's probably you know, what it should be. But then in math, you have to prove it. And until you have proven something, the assumption is that it is wrong. And so you, you have to show, you have to convince people that this is correct. And people are not going to believe you. They say, you know, I'm very knowledgeable. This is true. They, they really want to see it. And you have to give them a logical argument as to why what you think is true. Philippe, compared to the math of social interaction, where it's the opposite, where you don't necessarily need proof. It relies so heavily on belief, what people accept as a solution or as truth. Whereas in math, you really have to present proof to your ideas. What are your thoughts about those differences? It's a great question. Uh, it may be a tricky question. I don't know. No, it's not a tricky question. I, and I, I think it's, um, it reflects two different things. I, th I think math, so th there is a, 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 a fun joke that uh, mathematicians have, which is what's the difference between pure mathematics and applied mathematics? So uh -huh. pure mathematics is to give an exact solution to approximate problems. Applied mathematics is to give an approximate solution to exact problems. Okay, so. And, and, and I think uh, I get the, the joke. I feel so smart. <laughs> so I think the what what you are uh, saying is that social interaction is about approximate solutions to yes. exact problems. And uh, math has a certain beauty, and it has a, rem a remarkable effectiveness in physics. You know, people go to the moon. We talk to each other because there is actually tons of math that connect you to me right now through the internet. Uh, but, but, but it's not about um, feelings. It's not about emotion. I mean, mathematicians have lots of feelings and emotion, but it's not what the subject is about. So you can make model, you can theorize these things, but th those are models. You know, th there's our, mm -hmm. th th there's our Try, we, we try to make sense of the world, but it, it's a never endless quest. This is why you know, all this field of knowledge, whether it's math or physics, there, there are still people wondering about tons of things. Uh, and, and, and I think the uh, social interactions with people is, is one of these things that we can try to conceptualize, mm -hmm. but it's so rich that it's extremely difficult to uh, do more, I would say, than just scratching the surface. You, know, you, you can model social interaction, but you realize that these models are very poor. And the other thing also is that social interaction is something that changes a lot over time. When you look at the way people social interact now compared to 20 years ago, 20 years yeah. ago compared to 40 years ago, I mean, the way people interact is very, very different. What if you think of the way an object fall, uh, the object has been falling the same way since you know the beginning <laughs> of, of mankind. I mean, so so when you think of all these models that get developed for physics, there yeah. is an amazing uh, time. There is an amazing amount of experience experiments that people have been able to do. What in social interactions you can do some experiments, but the reality is that things are changing, and that changes actually makes 
modeling makes understanding that reality particularly difficult, all the more that that reality is actually very complex. Well, this seems actually like an excellent transition into the topic at hand, which is change. You've used the word changing and how social interactions are, are repeatedly changing. Talk to me about change. What is your perspective when you think about change in this sort of broad way? So if we're going to talk about broad way, maybe we should start with the really ancient way. Okay. So Heraclitus was a Greek philosopher. So that's about, you know, 2,000 years ago. And uh, what he pointed out is that everything changes and nothing remains. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so what is also interesting about it, it's in some sense self-contradictory because everything changes and nothing remains is a universal affirmation. So it's something that remains constant. The fact that things change and nothing remains, remains a constant. Right. And, and, and I, that's I do find that so fascinating. I mean, that's, you know, it makes me think of the, the boat, the ship of Theseus or the boat of Theseus, where if you're replacing the boards and you replace the mast and you replace the sail and you replace the people on the ship, is it still the same? Is it still the boat? Yeah, is it the, the same ship? You have another interesting example, which is a car moving on the road. Mm. So the car is changing place, but the speed is constant. <laughs> okay. There's another one that I was thinking also. Uh, so the duration of the podcast, let's say, is an hour. Mm -hmm. If I'm telling you in an hour, you and I will travel 1,000 miles. You will wonder how is it possible? Right. Now, in reality, the Earth rotates on itself. If you are at the equator in an hour, you have moved by 1,000 miles. Okay. So what is even more fascinating is that I can tell you by the end of our discussion, we would have traveled 67,000 miles. Huh? And that's because the Earth is rotating around the sun. So in an hour, we're going to travel 67,000 miles. And you don't perceive it in any other way than the change of the season over the year that repeats. So this completely feeds into half of my belief system around change, which is that change is easy because it's happening all of the time without us even noticing. Yeah. I, I, it's something I find also really amazing that, uh, and, and I think it's actually very important because I really think that change is, is what allows us to perceive time. You, you, you could sit on a rock, you know, in a, in a desert. And on a very sunny day, you know, sometime that the, the or, or let's say you could sit, no, it would be even better. You sit in a room with artificial uh -huh. light so that you don't even see the sun passing. Okay. Perfect. So it's a totally Sounds empty like Sounds like half of the people who listen to this show, it sounds like half of their past year where they just sat in their room. Right, they, they could just sit on their room, uh, keep the podcast on, but close your eyes, okay? And, and, and just think that nothing outside is happening. The reality is that if you stay there after a few hours, something's going to change. At some point, I guarantee you, you will be either first, thirsty or hungry. And by noticing that change in your body, you will realize that time has passed. So I, I think changes is the way, is what allows us to perceive time. If, if mm -hmm. nothing changes, then we have no notion of time. So oh, that's interesting. So changes, I think, is very important because time is something which is very important to us. Uh, but, but as you say, what I find also interesting is that the seasons are changing but they are repeating. And, and it's something yes. that as a mathematician, I find it's very interesting because in, in mathematics, you, 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 you try to look at things in many ways. And, and, and some of them is to understand how different things look the same. So again, think of the car moving on the highway, the position is changing. Mm -hmm. So immediately we say, but what can we find that is constant? And we may say, well, maybe the speed is constant. 
And if the speed is constant, is not constant, what do we do? Well, we look at acceleration. But amazingly, we, we always try to find constancies in all the sea of changes. And, and I really think that, that it's absolutely necessary for us to find this constant in the changes because changes are just exhausting. I mean, if, if think, of, think, of, think of yourself, think of the, the children I find are just a wonderful example of people who have constant changes. Because yes. you, you're born, you know absolutely nothing about this world. And every second of your life at the very beginning is a totally new experience. But look at how much they sleep. I mean, a, 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 a young baby spends a huge amount of time to sleep to be able to absorb all these changes that they witness at every minute of their life. And if we were more than subject, witness, they, and they also experience, right? Their yeah, limbs experience. are growing, their faces are developing, their eyes yeah. are coming into focus. Yes, and and if we we're if all our life was so much of learning, so much of novelty, so much of changes. I think we would just be dead. I mean, we, we just couldn't We're bear it. You know, it's just impossible. In a heap. It's just impossible. Uh, so, that's intriguing. So, well, so that goes to the other half of the belief system, right? Which is that change is hard. Um, it's It seems to me that both are simultaneously true. Change is easy. It's happening all the time. Change is hard because it's exhausting and it, you have to process it. And I suppose it depends on the change, right? If it's changing socks, the constant is that we'll always be changing our socks. So we accept this change as a constant, based on what I'm hearing from you. Yeah, yeah, and Which, the socks is also an interesting thing because we, you know, you know, you you, you wear your clothes. At the end yeah. of the day, they are dirty, so you're going to wash them to bring them back to their previous state. But they don't. They they degrade over time. Oh, they, they degrade never over go time. Back yeah. To the yeah, yeah, yeah. State. But that's why people feel sorry about it, about it. But I mean, it's an unfortunate effect of physics. But there's also this this reality that. As, as the day goes, your, your, your clothes get dirty, and therefore you want to bring them back in that previous stage. And so you, you want to vert it by putting them in the washing machine. Yeah. Uh, but, but uh, so, sorry, and I, I'm kind of divesting, and other than uh, just remind me what, what, what the point you were making. And uh, no, that actually, that is completely related, which is simply the, cha the discussion at hand in oh. my mind is, is change hard or is change easy? And I yeah. think the answer is it's both. It's both, yeah, I agree with you. What I find it really striking when you look at people is that um, we, we can think of that, we, we can look at their lives and, and sometimes we would say, oh, his life hasn't changed much. Mm -hmm. Or we would say, well, it's amazing what this guy has, has gone through. But, but, but when you look at the vast majority of people, I mean, that actually everybody, it, it's really amazing how much we change. You know, we, 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 we're born at some point, we're a little child, and, and then we grow up, we become teenager, we become adult. Uh, maybe we start to date at some point, people, you know, get married mm -hmm. or serious partnership, they get kids, uh, which mm -hmm. I think is a big change in the life of, of somebody when you start to be a parent. Then maybe you have your first job, your first paycheck, your first car, your first this, your first that. I mean, there's always a first something. Uh, right. And then at your some point- uh, you know, Your first arthritic knee. Yeah, your, uh, first arthritic uh, knee, your first, your first uh, crone, acid, you know. <laughs> acid, uh, acid stomach heartburn after uh, feeling it, your first- uh, <laughs> It's quite amazing, actually. And, and so you, you, you yeah. see all these changes that, that people uh, undergo and then you maybe you retire you have your first day with no boss you have your first gray air you have your first uh i don't know what to the doctor and 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 you you see that life is passing and and people are changing and i also find it very interesting the way we talk about these changes so yeah. i i think most people who are i would say o older than 20 probably live that experience where uh, you you encounter a, a young child, let's say in your 20s, and then you see that young child 15 years later, who is now a teenager or almost, you know, a, a full adult. And, and you look at this person and you say, oh, you have grown up so much, I can't recognize yeah. you. Okay. <laughs> but then you have also the other way around that you see people who, who you knew they were 60 and now they are 80. And right. what's really interesting is the way we talk about the difference of the way we're going to speak about these people. 
that the 80 years old, you would go back to your home and you would tell, you know, your spouse, gosh, she got really old, you know, now has a big belly, has white hairs, but you won't tell the person, gosh, you got really old, you have white hairs. And yeah, belly. right. You know, so, so there's this perception of having positive changes. And I wouldn't say negative changes, but changes that are unavoidable that we want to ignore. Yeah, well, people will go out of their way. They'll even lie straight to your face, right? So going to a high school reunion, someone looks at you and they say, you haven't changed a day. And it's obviously untrue because uh, if someone says it to me, I'm like, thanks for the intent behind the statement. But, you know, it's like, well, I wasn't wearing glasses in high school as cool as these glasses. So even that alone, these are cooler glasses. That's a change. But also I, my hairstyle has changed. I have gray hair. I have wrinkles. I'm a different size. So um, I wear makeup. Right That's answer. not something. So it's like it's like a huge list of changes I'm hyper aware of if I were to think back to who I was. But, um, you know, they look at you and I think people think that it's a compliment to say you haven't changed since you were young, as if to say you have a youthful glow about you now, um, which I think is really interesting. We're very afraid culturally at least in this country, I can't really speak to other countries around this, but it feels like based on my conversations with friends, it's a similar fear, this fear of the inevitable change of getting old and then changing from the state of being alive to no longer living. I, I think there may be a, a possible answer to this type of remark is to ask the question, the, the people, so you think I didn't live? Ooh, ooh, because the, the reality that's, ooh, that's is spicy. that- the, the reality is that, you know, if you live, you change. I mean, th there is no yes. a rock sitting there at our scale doesn't change. But in the lifetime of that rock, it goes through a great deal of change. Yeah, but the lifetime of a rock is, you know, billions of years. Yes. Uh, but, but, but at our scale, the rock doesn't change. But any living yeah. things at our scale changes. So mm -hmm. if you haven't changed, you haven't lived. You haven't lived. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, that's spicy. I like that. Um, Philippe, I'm curious, when you think about your own life, when you think back to all of these moments that you've um, made choices or gone through your own uh, changes in your life, is there a particular story that sort of sticks out in your memory as a particularly uh, interesting fork in the road for you? I, I was actually thinking of this question. Yeah. Um, and I, I will tell you a list of changes that uh -huh. I went through okay. beyond the fact that indeed there is aging, growing up and so on and so forth. Okay. Sure. So when I was a child, we used to spend the summer in, the, in a very rural place of France where my grandparents had a, their, their farm. And, and I'm not super old, as you can see. Uh, nevertheless, I remember when we started to have running water. So in the summer, when I was very, very little, my mother would go to the pound to wash clothes. And one day we got running water. I remember uh, in France, there was one year that they changed all the telephone number because they ran out of numbers. And so they realized that to change the system. So the entire country changed telephone numbers. It's a major operation. I remember when we got our first TV. I remember when we got our first dishwasher. There was no dishwasher. Uh, I remember also when the country changed the electrical system from 110 voltage to 220, the entire country. You remember that? Uh, it's, it's not that old. It was in the, in the, I think it was in the 80s, 1980. Okay. So the, because the 110 was, uh, it's not very, uh, efficient for transporting electricity. So 220 is better. Of course, I remember the beginning of the internet. I, I remember actually somebody writing me, do you do email through a letter? You know, he sent me a letter. Do you do email? Okay. Uh, that was in the early 90s. Uh, I certainly remember the arrival of the mobile phone. I also uh, remember when we got our first phone, because phones actually were not even home phones. Uh, when, when I was a child, I mean, my grandparents had their, their home phone, but, but my parents, we didn't have a phone. I mean, my parents were not very rich and we just didn't have a phone. Uh, I also remember when we changed all the currency in France. We went from the French franc to Euro. That was in uh, 2000, I think. Um, 
I also remember when I acquired a new citizenship because I was French and I became uh, at some point an American citizen. Uh, when I was a child, we did not travel at all. Uh, my parents had no means to travel. And, and there was a time I took my the first large plane to come to this country. Uh, that was in the 1990s. Uh, I'm one of those people who became cosmopolitan. I'm, 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 I have no pride nor shame to admit that I'm one of those people who ride the road to globalization. And so I have connections in North America. Part of my family is in Europe. Part of my family is in Asia. And I've been traveling around all these countries, which when I think of myself when I was a child was unthinkable, just unthinkable. But when I look at just myself and, and reflect on these questions, I'm actually really amazed by how much my life has changed in a way that I could not foresee at all when I was way younger. And at the same time, in my inner self conversation, I am still who I was when I was 16, say. Not when I was five, but I think when I was 16, 18, uh, I, I, I have to a great extent, the same ideals, the same enthusiasm. And around all those changes, there is this core, which is, I think, very stable. I, well, first of all, I, I actually really love this. Um, these sort of like, in my head, you know, I like to picture when people are talking, I like to create pictures. And um, in my head, what I was picturing was like, Polaroids going through a photo album, like the moment we got water, the moment we got a dishwasher, like I could picture you sort of like putting a Polaroid on the coffee table of our conversation, uh, these little snapshots of stories, which is really interesting to me. But I am intrigued by this not having running water to having running water. And um, I'm intrigued by that. So tell, I would love it if you would be willing to tell me more about what it was like before you had running water and then what sparked getting running water and then how did that, I imagine that must have been very different. Your habits in the household must have changed immensely. So you have to realize I was actually super, super small. What, what I do remember very vividly is all this big uh, construction engines, which for a little boy were, you know, massive. Of course, they, they were not any more massive than what you see nowadays. They, they, they were probably actually even smaller. Uh, but, but being very little, you know, I was maybe four, five years old. So, so they were like digging in the ground. And yeah, they were digging in the ground up. to put all the pipes. And, and, and I think w what happened is that, uh, so it's probably one of the most remote places in France. Uh, it, it's a village that has literally three families. And the, the closest bakery is like seven miles away on a super windy road. Uh, and and it, it's it's one of the least densely populated part of France. Uh, it's in some extent very backward, uh, in other extent actually very forward. Uh, but but, but I, I think at some point the uh, you know government decided that the country should have running water. And it's probably way, way back. I mean, it must have been you know beginning of the 20th century, but it took a lot of time to put all these pipes in the country. I mean, I don't know how long it took in the US to put all the pipes in the country. Uh, what I do know is that I remember three, four years ago, reading an article saying that in some of the Western states, they still have wooden wooden pipes that were put in the 19th century that are still with us nowadays. So obviously, you know, all this major infrastructure is a huge amount of work. And so what I do remember is that I do remember my mother indeed going to wash clothes in a pound that was maybe uh, 200 yards from the house. There was a, uh, it's a place that has a lot of natural springs. And, and so it's a very, the, the, the ground around us is, is very damp and you have places where you have naturally formed little pounds. So she had, a, she had like a laundry basket and she would go to the pound and she would wash the clothes in the pound. Uh, which of course now everybody would complain that it's, she's polluting the, the, the water. But I mean, at that time, that's what everybody did in the village because nobody had really... So, so there was a little bit of running water from wells. Uh, but, but, but the water was precious because you use it to drink. 
and 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 so you people didn't want to spend the well water on things that were not deemed as essential obviously as drinking because if you don't have water to drink you die if you don't wash your clothes well you stink but that's about it okay <laughs> so so washing water was washing clothes was, was certainly not something that was worth the water of the well uh, and, and also, we didn't have the well really in our house. It was actually, we still need to, to, to walk to the well. Uh, so, so, yeah, she would take the bucket. She would go to the, to the pound. And she would actually wash the clothes in the pound the way she could do it. Uh, and and then, then she would, you know, hang them and, and, and they would dry. That's amazing. So, uh, and so then what happened after you got water? How did things shift in the house? Do you remember? So I, I think for me, it, it didn't make uh, a, a huge difference because as a, as, a, as a child, particularly a little child, I, you know, other than drinking, I mean, I'm sure there was a way I would wash myself, uh, but, but I don't really remember that part. And, and other than drinking, I had no particular needs. And, and, and as a child, you know, water would always be available to drink. So it's not like I would need to go to the well and, and, and get some water. It was always available to drink. So for me, uh, I, I think I didn't really see the difference, except that my mother was actually super happy. <laughs> you know, suddenly her life changed. And I could see that her life changed, even though I didn't quite know in, in which way. But, but obviously you could see that my mother was way happier. She was, I guess, relieved. Uh, and, and she was probably finding uh, the summer stay in the house way, way more pleasant than before. Uh, so, so uh, yeah, for, for her, it makes, it, it makes a way bigger difference than, than, than for me. But, but as a child, I, I perceive you know, that, that, that this change for her was quite major. It's remarkable. I mean, it's not, it also makes me reflect a bit on my own childhood and the, the type of changes that I saw, which were much, um, they just sound so much fancier or less like to me, running water is so vital, but it's something I completely took for granted. It was never an issue. It was never a well, question. It was, we didn't walk anywhere to get water. We walked to the kitchen sink. Uh, yeah. I remember when we got a water filter and then the water tasted better. <laughs> and uh, it's too bad because I didn't think you would ask me the you know questions about this. But uh, on the top of my head, I would tell you that there's probably about half of mankind that doesn't have running water right now. Yes, uh, I, I am aware of that. Yes. Uh, yeah, yeah. I can't remember what's the proportion, but it's far more than you know what it should be. I think. Uh, and 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 I know people who uh, I, I I remember actually I know very well people. Um, who spent six months living in dirt because their house has been demolished. So for mm. them, when you think of the change they underwent, you know, it's it's even way bigger. Uh, yes. Yeah, it's it's really amazing how much uh, people can stand and endure changes that um, you know hurt them, hurt their family, hurt their belonging. Uh, it, it, it's it's really striking, and you know, this business of running water. I understand it may sound exotic to you, uh, and, and I think it's great. So different, it just different. I, I think it's great. Sounds, I, I think it's, yeah, yeah. I, I think it's great. I mean, he shows that you, you you lived, you know, in a, in a prosperous country and had a uh, you know a healthy childhood, which uh, hopefully is the case. And 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 in some sense, it's very positive that that you find it uh, interesting and intriguing. Uh, but at the same time, when I, when I put these things in, into a broader context. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm glad it happened, but it's also utterly mundane, actually, that, that when you think of other problems, you know, this one, yeah, it's great, but uh, this is not, you know, this, this was not the worst. <laughs> uh, sure, sure, sure. I mean, I, th I think you actually, you raise a really interesting point, which is, you know, the focus of most of my guests on this show, um, because of the context of where we all have grown up and where we live, the focus is often on personal change, like, um, you know, a lot of people want to tell me their stories of moving from one career to a different career, for example. Um, or I'll hear stories of something unexpected happened and then my perspective changed. And I, I love all of these stories. But I think to me, what's really intriguing is, you know, 
this idea of change is good and change is easy to change is bad or change is hard uh, to change is constant to we look for constants to help us cope with change it applies deeply as well to the context of all of these stories the the human ability to adapt to change and simultaneously resist change is just a fascinating thing to me um and then when we've got all of this other stuff sort of like that we can take for granted like running water and high spot high speed internet you know my kids growing up never having known what the world was like before the internet you know it's like so, so uh, yeah, then and, and you I get like really this. focused on yourself, I guess. Uh, uh, yeah, just... for, for me, I'm not really focused on on, on myself at all. Uh, yes, I, I do some introspection. I'm not, you know, denying it. Uh, but but th th this question of change hard is is very interesting because I think we 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 tend to think of it's hard for us to change. Mm -hmm. Now, recently, I was. Uh, talking with a former colleague of mine who works in, he, study, he studies communication. And he was uh, talking of a children game and it doesn't really matter what it is, but, but it made me reflect, reflecting on this, this question of communication. So speaking, how long humans have been speaking? It's about, so it depends, you know, how you count humans and so on so forth. But, but, but it's considered that the origin of the language is about 200 to 500,000 years old. So we have been perfecting languages so that you and I can have this meaningful conversation for over 200,000 years. Drawing pictures. That is 50,000 years old. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing you through this video link, which is an image moving. Image came up about 50,000 years ago. Okay. Writing, three, 5,000 years old. Anything after that, the internet and all that stuff, it's a combination of those three things. But what I find amazing is that you look at now things like illiteracy. Mm -hmm. You still have about 10% of the planet of people who just don't know how to read and write. Now, you think of these 5,000 years of changes where humans came from not being able to write to 90% of them being able to write. It took 5,000 years. So change is really, really hard. It took mm -hmm. us 5,000 years to learn to write. You know, and, and, and when you think of those massive changes, it's actually really, really hard. Think of changing from war to peace. Mm. You know, war has been around forever, but the world has never been as peaceful as now to some extent. But it took a lot of time, a lot of effort to get there. And that's the part of the difficulty of changes that I find is also interesting is there is our own difficulty of changing, but there is an amazing difficulty in changing the world for good. Another thing I find amazing is you ask people, here is an object, mm -hmm. can you destroy it? They can do it instantly. It's amazingly easy to just smash it. <laughs> now, you give them a drawing, say, can you build it? It's amazingly difficult. <laughs> and and, and, and I, what I find is that actually, I think there are some positive changes that are amazingly difficult to do. And, and, and certainly when you look at all this infrastructure, like you know, water, because we're talking about water, fighting disease, promoting peace, uh, making people more educated. What I find is really amazing is that in some sense, it, 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 it's, it, you would say, well, it's not complicated. If you want peace, well, you, you just stop fighting. Right. But, but, but try to make it happening. And then you realize that those problems are really difficult. So when you think of all those problems, there are those that can be solved by technology. And 
they create a lot of changes that we see. You know, we see the internet, we see different way of working. And I would say there's other changes that are easy to make, but maybe more difficult for, for us as an individual to go through. You know, you, you, you suddenly you, we're working in the office, now we work remotely as a person. It may be hard to do, but it's sometimes it's an easy change to do because all the technology is here. Okay, so it's a change that the technology, the technological change is actually quite easy. Mm-hmm. And then you have all these problems that cannot be solved by technology. So learning people how to write, well, we know how to do it. It's just a matter of doing it. Okay. Uh, making peace, we know how to do it. It's just a matter of doing it. And, and, and those problems is actually mind boggling how difficult the change is to go from the state to the next one. Uh, so, so. Uh, Philippe, I have super enjoyed hearing your insights on all of this. And I think that last point particularly uh, hits home to so much of what people experience as individuals and then bear witness to as society at large grapples with the changes that we say we want versus the actions that we seem to take. Um, really, 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 really great insights. How, how do you, do you, I, do you, are you open to connecting to people? How do if people want to find out about you or, I mean, you know, your job isn't philosophizing about change. This has been a wonderful conversation, but you do other stuff. Is there a place that I can send people who want a little bit more of your uh, good brain work? Yeah, yeah. so they, they can go to, uh, so, so if they really want uh, to do some business first with Last Ditch, they can go to uh, Last Ditch Consulting, just in one word, dot com. Uh, if they want to connect with me uh, on a professional basis, they can also go to LinkedIn. So I'm on LinkedIn. And uh, if they want to just know me better, they can also go to my personal website, uh, which is ph-barb.com. So Wonderful. And I'll have links to all of that in the show notes. Yeah, for the episode. Yeah. Well, any last thoughts before we say farewell? No, I, I think, you know, we, 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 we surveyed... Uh, a, a fair amount of things. I, I think the uh, it's something we 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 talked about at, at the, maybe the beginning, which is this question of uh, normalization of behavior. I think people. Mm. So so when you think of change, there is a change of over time, but there's also a change that you kind of go across. Uh, and, and I think when you look at precisely at, at at the current time going across, I think it's very important that as we go from one person to another we see change, that, that we're not uniform, that we're not, in some sense, we're not equal. We, we are, you know, I like the fact that when you look at those, those political declarations, it's, it's the declaration of human rights is we're equal in rights. But you and I, you know, we look different and, and I think it's great and we think differently and it's great, this is, this is an advantage. And so when I think of those changes, I think it's very important to change in a way that uh, brings us together, but yet distinguishes us mm-hmm. and, 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 and keeps some form of distinction so that one of us is not all of us. Because you know, I, I think if, if, if we become identical, then we became exactly like this stupid nails in the boxes. You can take any of them. It doesn't matter. And, yeah. and I think it's, it's very important that when I talk to you, I have a different experience than if I talk to somebody else. So I think it's very important that people keep their uniqueness and change if they want to change. It's not change for the sake of it, change to look like the other, but it's change to, uh, to enrich the world, I would say, and not to uniformize it. I love that. Change for uh, the better is no guarantee, but I love the idea that uh, all of us are better than one of us and holding on to that uniqueness helps to ensure that we have that diversity of thought and experience and appearance and everything. You know, as I say, I went through a lot of failure as a scientist. That's that's the life of a scientist. And, And I think people should not be afraid to fail in their endeavor. 
uh, if they think that they want to get from point A to point B, then start walking. It may not take you to point B, it's okay. It will take you maybe to point C, but it's okay. If you can afford it, and not everybody can afford it, but if you can afford it, start walking. Love it. Thank you so much, Philippe. This has been an absolute pleasure. Thank you, Adam. I hope it's useful and, and can help people. This conversation has really served as a great reminder of just how adaptable we are as humans. Thinking back to February of this year, here in Oregon, we were hit with the same ice storm that swept so much of the country. We lost our internet first, and then our cellular signal. Shortly thereafter, we lost power. Before the end of the first day, we had already adapted this new routine of bundling up and walking a few blocks away so that we could catch a cellular signal and call our family members. It was shockingly fast, in fact, how quickly this became our routine. And then fast forwarding one week later, internet power and cellular fully restored. In resuming our day-to-day lives, there were some noticeable differences. Without even talking about it, we had shifted our habits when our environment changed. And then in changing back, we kept some of those new habits. Now, of course, I recognize that these adaptations are specific to living in the land of plenty. In other places, humans adapt to far more extreme conditions, as Philippe is right to point out. Is change hard? Yeah, it is. Is it easy? Also, yes. I want to hear from you. If you got something out of this episode and you enjoyed it, please share it with a friend and leave us a review on iTunes. Thank you, Philippe, for sharing your perspective and stories today. You'll find links to connect with him in the show notes for this episode. Let's keep the conversation going. Join the Facebook group, facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash change hub. Special thanks go to my family for their love, support, and patience. To all of the amazing Changed Podcast Patreon page members who I couldn't do this without. The Art of Change Skills for Life and Patreon member producer, Dr. Rick Kirshner. Thank you for listening to the Changed Podcast. I'm Aidan Nepom, and I wish you the kind of experiences in life you're excited to tell stories about.